Women's Lives are the subject of a new comprehensive resource book on mental health from Beacon Press. Entitled The Complete Guide to Mental Health for Women, this groundbreaking book includes essays from more than 50 medical experts on women's psychology across life stages, mental disorders, and varying possibilities for treatment, as well as recommendations for maintenance of mental health. Leading our discussion of women's unique needs in the field of mental health is Jessica Henderson Daniel, one of the editors of the guide. Jessica Henderson Daniel is Director of Training in Psychology at Children's Hospital in Boston and Assistant Professor at Harvard Medical School. She is past president of the Society for the Psychology of Women in the American Psychological Association. Welcome to Cambridge Forum, Jessica Henderson Daniel. Good evening, I'm delighted to be here tonight to talk about this wonderful document. I'm beginning the evening with just a few comments about uh, the background in terms of the development of this document. Basically, Beacon Press invited three women who didn't know each other, but who were very committed to women's issues, to come together to edit a book on mental health and women. Why women? Well, because women are not men. And so much of research has been centered around men's issues and men's perspectives. And we decided, with the support, of course, in, of Beacon Press, that it was a great idea to produce a book that would address women's development. So this book is interesting in that it takes a developmental perspective on women's lives. You know that um, for many years we've looked at child development and adolescent development, and with people living for longer periods of time, we need to see adult development along um, the many years rather than just seeing adult development in a very discrete um, period of time. So this book is about normal development. It addresses also the reality that if, in the words of someone I know, if you live long enough, life happens. And when life happens, this book has suggestions and ideas about tackling life. Life happens in terms of the challenges of life, the ups and downs of life, and so there are chapters that deal with that. This book also is a wonderful resource for answering questions, and at least making you aware that there are questions to be asked, about mental health issues. It deals with um, psychopharmacology, which is very important in terms of knowing a little bit about that. It doesn't take the place of your talking to psychiatrists, but it does give you some guidance about how to approach this topic. It also tells you about therapy techniques that are available currently some of the basic ones that are around, so you'll have some notion about what you might expect in receiving mental health services. It gives you also, which is very important, something about the ethics of seeking therapy and receiving therapy, so that you know what to expect in terms of your own protection. A final section of the book deals with life in terms of its joys, and how, do you, how can you live perhaps stress-free? How can you play? Because it turns out adults like to play too. Uh, the role of spirituality, the role of exercise. So this is a book that has been written by, as is indicated in the introduction, more than 50 contributors. Tonight, I will not try to represent 50 people. I am only one. But what I can do is to offer you some general comments and respond to your questions about the content of this very critical book that is a resource book. It is not generally a book that you would read from cover to cover but it's a great book to have by your bedside that you can read as a reference and also to give to your daughters and granddaughters as they go off to college because they also need resources to be aware of mental health, mental health issues in their lives. So I'd like to just end with that and um, open it up for questions and comments from the audience that's present here tonight. I'm going to take this microphone and ask the first question, but first I'm going to remind the radio audience that you're joining us at Cambridge Forum listening to Jessica Henderson Daniel discussing mental health in women. And 
Jessica, I'd like to, to comment on the organization of the book, and my question really comes from that. Approximately half of the book is devoted to the ver various contexts for viewing women's mental health, different life stages, variations in sexual preference, race and ethnicity. What led you to organize the book this way? And does this mean or does this lead us to the conclusion that women's lives are by definition predisposing them to have mental health issues? Well, let me just say a resounding no. The anti women are not more prone to have mental health issues than men. The rationale for providing context is the reality that we, we, meaning human beings, live in context. We don't live in isolation. So the book really reflects life, and people live in various contexts. And contexts determine the challenges that you face. For example, women who live in poverty, that's a particular context that talks about resources, access to resources, quality of resources that are available. It makes a difference in a woman's life if she's poor. It, it makes, it's a huge uh, factor in terms of her living. Uh, another factor that's really uh, very important is the developmental stage. Women who are 18 have very different lives from women who are 60 and 70. It is a context, and it is not saying that ne they're necessarily prone to mental illness, but women need to know that there are different challenges, uh, different uh, life contexts, and that they maybe have different response patterns that reflect a he healthy uh, outlook on life. Can you give us a, a very specific example that would bring that idea to life? Well, let's, let's talk about one of the contexts where that, that's addressed in the book, and that is the context of divorce. That is, in fact, something that happens to women. About 50% of women. Absolutely. 50% so of married it's, women. It's uh, quite, quite a large. And th there's a chapter there written by a psychologist who's active in the American Psychological Association, which is how I got her to participate in the project, who has studied the impact of divorce on the, on the lives of women. And because it happens, it doesn't, and, and by the way, the rate of divorce has increased, and it's a context for the rate of divorce increasing for women, and we need to understand it in context. And that is, women are initiating divorce much more readily than they have in the past, because women often now have financial resources to live on their own, and they're not necessarily having to live with uh, persons they don't care to live with anymore. So uh, the context of, of divorce and separation needs to be explored. It is, in fact, a loss. And what the author is able to do, and I actually know this chapter a little bit, I don't know all, all the chapters in the book, but it talks about the different changes that occur as a function of someone getting a divorce. It's a change in roles. It used to be a duo, now you're a single. It's a change in terms of how people see you. It's a change of resources. There are many different changes. And the other thing that is so important in this chapter is because it's written from a woman's perspective, and women often, despite women's movement and all, have a very large responsibility for children, this is a book that explains how to talk to children about divorce and some of the basic components of the conversation so children don't internalize their feeling like it's their responsibility why people are going to divorce. So it is placed in context and then how people may move on after the divorce and about an initial relationship may be a transitional relationship rather than a relationship for life. So that's part of the reality of our society with 50% of marriages ending in divorce. That's a context that women have to face. Another organizational question, you cross-reference this resource book very carefully, and many of the chapters cross-reference the essay on anger. Anger is clearly, a, plays a very central role in women's lives. What, can you say some more about that role, and how does this emotion of anger affect women's mental health? Well, I think the authors there, one of them, Lynn Michael Brown, who um, wrote about it with her, um, the co-author, 
Um, I, in particular, asked for that chapter in the book. I will own that. Uh, that we talk about anger in particular because culturally, uh, not only in this country but around the world, that women are socialized not to express anger. They're, they really turn it inward, and it's very important to recognize that women have those feelings, and often there's a genuine um, ideology or cause for them having those feelings. Women's anger can be connected to lots of life experiences. The previous topic, divorce, can make people really angry. Traumas can make people angry. Um, when you have been traumatized, be it sexual trauma, domestic violence, all those are very related to women being angry because they've been mistreated. The other thing in a society where women's wages are different from men's wages, that uh, sometimes that is a source of anger and frustration for women. So the context of the society often is not advantageous for women and there are reasons for them to be angry or, or they're slighted in ways. There are lots of times in women's lives where they're not treated fairly and the response pattern to that is to be angry. Now, if you, when reading the chapter, there is a section in terms of talking about how women may be treated in terms of managing their anger, understanding the ideology of the, of the anger so it doesn't consume oneself. You know, uh, one of the things that I do as a therapist is that I draw a brain and I say to people that if most of your brain is consumed by anger, there isn't much left to be smart. And so that one of the things is for people to be able to manage that particular affect. That affect can be very con controlling of one's whole, all one's resources. Anger can be very big, and it can be, almost become the image of a person. And so that, that's why that topic is very important. And it cuts across. The beauty of the book is that you can be reading a particular chapter, and then you can see how it's related to other topics. And it's because life is interrelated. You aren't just anger, you aren't just divorce, you're, you're lots of different experiences that generate different affective states. Can anger ever contribute to mental health? Absolutely. How? In fact, I, uh, holding in anger, denying anger, uh, can lead to mental distress. Uh, expressing anger in ways that are healthy and constructive and move you forward can lead to increased mental health. And it's very important for people not to turn it inward. In fact, depression often is angered toward in, turned inward, and it's uh, a need for women to avoid that particular state of affairs. Can you give us, this may not be a fair question, but I'll ask it anyway. Can you give us some numbers? I, I have read that women suffer from depression more often than men. What about some other mental disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar disease? Well, let me just place it in context. In a society <laughs> where women are socialized to talk about feelings more than men are socialized to talk about feelings, it is more likely that women will seek services when they're having difficulties with their feelings. I know that I don't have the data and I didn't come prepared to give you exact numbers, that women are more likely to seek um, psychological and psychiatric services, and depression is at a higher rate for women. But I'm not so persuaded that men don't get depressed too, except it's expressed differently. Um, so that in, in, this, in a society, um, I don't think we want to say that women are necessarily prone to certain illnesses. But there are um, some things that we do have to consider. One of the co-editors is a psychiatrist, um, Dr. Amy Banks. And when we were on another um, program together, it was very interesting because she talked about the hormonal changes that occur in adolescence and that there are real changes in the body that may contribute to some imbalance occasionally in terms of the lives of girls. But we don't want that to be construed as um, abnormal. That's, a normal functioning that women's lives and bodies change in adolescence. Um, and so I don't want to say, well, that means women are more inclined to have mental illness. I don't think that's the case at all. But certainly having to manage those, those hormonal differences is a challenge for women. I would like to place it that way and put a positive spin to it. Because of the hormonal changes, we in fact, um, we're the ones who produce children, which is probably why we don't we have me standing here alone tonight, uh, that uh, that is a particular role that women play. 
Another time that women have to juggle hormonal changes is after the birth of a, of a baby. And this can lead to very serious psychiatric disorder, postpartum depression. Um, society is not, at least society in the industrialized world, doesn't seem to be set up very well to handle this, this situation or to help women handle this situation. Can you generalize about the social supports that are available for women in supporting their mental health? Well, I would agree that um, there's been some real changes in this country with regard to the level of support that's available to women. In earlier periods where people stayed close to home, had generations available to provide assistance, it was more possible and more probable that a mother received support from an extended family. Currently, people are highly mobile, and so you have people who are living away from family or having um, grandparents who are themselves in the middle of a career and aren't able to come and assist, so that people, after delivering, are often having to pay for services, which are not quite the same as having family there, um, and and therefore are often left on their own to manage it. There are some hospitals across the country in some places where they have built into the um, program uh, after delivery where they have visiting nurses, regardless of who you are, who go out and check on the, on the mothers, offer them support, provide them information, check on their um, mental health as well as check on the babies. It's sort of a normal process rather than there's something wrong with you and I'm coming to your house. Um, but it is a vulnerable time for women, and for some women, the postpartum depression is very serious, and they end up needing um, psychiatric care and sometimes hospitalization at that time. It is not the case of, for everyone, but it does occur. I think that um, it would be good in our society. I know that health issues are big now uh, in terms of financing it, but it would be great if we had... Um, build into our society normal health care benefits for everyone so that if one had a baby, we know that there are some vulnerabilities for women at that point that they would receive care on a regular basis rather than having to see them. They're receiving care as something abnormal because we have babies born all the time every day. This is not an unusual event. You are listening to Jessica Henderson Daniel discussing mental health in women the floor is now open for your questions and comments. And would you please line up at the microphone? I, I'm interested in uh, older women and the beginnings uh, of uh, dementia, if it's possible, or depression, and also medication, and if there's been, been much research done on this that's in your book. Um, there, are, there's, um, there, are, there is some attention to those uh, matters in the book. And uh, we are, let me just tell you again a context. Today people are living longer, so gerontology is a relatively new field um, for us in this country. Uh, and also there is, um, in this country that it's very youth-oriented, there is a tendency to devalue people as they get older rather than to see them as being valuable. One of the things that's clear around um, the age ageism, which is the ism that you're really raising, is that sometimes people who aren't trained don't understand the difference between um, dementia versus other medically related problems that may look like dementia. So having understanding that you need to be treated when you're older by someone who understands gerontology so that they're able to discriminate, a word that is loaded sometimes, but discrimination can make you wise, discriminate among the symptoms that people have in, as they grow older. And as we have a larger older population, more resources will be expended to look at that. And also more research about how older people manage there in the chapter dealing with uh, religion and spirituality and the lives of people, it is clear that pe in older individuals who have this belief system often have, more, have a high quality of life than those who do not. Those also who have built-in relationships 
as opposed to who are isolated also have a better quality of life. So if you will, uh, in my life as, in, as a psychologist at Children's Hospital, I tell the parents that those years before 12, they're preparing the children to get through adolescence. I would say the early uh, adulthood, you're preparing people to have a good older age period of time in terms of building relationships and taking care of their health. So that's, those are important components. So it's the physical component as well as the psychosocial component in terms of relationships. Relationships matter in terms of your mental health. And I think there was also a question about um, drugs, psychotropic drugs, and the aging process. Yes, and let me just say that um, there are times when, uh, uh, again, you, I'm not a physician, but let me just say you, that the need to go to people to seek services for individuals who are trained to work with older individuals and can discriminate among the symptoms that are presented. And, some, and, it's, and understand that, that the provider understands that providing medication to older people is important, that, that they are entitled to quality life no matter what age they are. That's the important part. And they need psychological and psychiatric relief regardless of age. Hi. Um, I have a question regarding um, motherhood. Uh, I read through the book somewhat and found that most of the areas that dealt with motherhood dealt with the normal stages or things that people would most often expect. I didn't find anything at all about uh, dealing with a child with disabilities. Um, and although it's perhaps not something everybody has to deal with, <laughs> mm -hmm. it is something that some people do have to deal with and does cause a major stress point. I wonder, did I miss anything in the book, or could you recommend some other resources also? I don't know that you missed something in the book, and I, and I, guess, and I don't recall that being in the book, and you're right, it's not there. There are, um, I believe you're right, it's not there. I can't really say that for sure. But I, I would say that um, there, uh, the American Disability Act, that um, if you probably go to the government National Institute of Mental Health website, you probably will be able to get resources around from that. And also the Children's Hospital here in Boston uh, deals with uh, youngsters who have disabilities, a range of disabilities, not just a few. Thank you. While well, people are gathering their thoughts, I'd like to follow up on that question about, about treatment with drugs. You said women are socialized to talk, and there has been some controversy or discussion at any rate of late about the increasing use of drugs to treat mental illness. And there have also been suggestions that drugs in combination with talk make both work better. Can you talk about that? direction for treatment a little? Uh, let me just say that this is a more of a Dr. Amy Banks response, but I will um, talk about her response to that in another setting. And that I believe in terms of the research that the combination uh, of psychopharmacology and um, talk therapy or various other forms of therapies have been found to be effective. What's important is to um, seek services from people who understand your particular symptomatology and are prepared to deal with that rather than it's either drugs or it's talk therapy. Um, some particular illnesses can be treated with talk therapy and some uh, are much more difficult to manage and need psychopharmacology. And um, it is an art in terms of deciding on dosage and, and getting it organized. To, and it needs to be monitored. It isn't just something that you take, so people need to be aware of that. And I think that's clear in the text that uh, it is a combination of the two. And often people start off with talk therapy or that kind of therapy and then move towards psychopharmacology if it's not being changed as a function of that. Good evening. Um, I have just glanced at your book. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with it in depth. Um, and I just looked at a section that was about domestic violence. But I was thinking, um, very new to the subject, but there are so many forms of abuse, some of which are very subtle. And um, 
I wonder how you could speak to the question of how to recognize, for instance, uh, if you're, well, I've worked as a teacher, so I know how difficult it is to recognize if a child is going through neglect or abuse and how charged that situation is. But as an adult who th considers oneself, you know, fairly observant and self-preserving, still you can find yourself involved in a relationship that of subtle abuse uh, abuse of qualities have nothing to do with physical. That's right. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that. Thank sure. You. I'm actually on the child abuse team at Children's Hospital, and a part of the team, Children's Hospital in Boston was one of the first hospitals to have a domestic violence program, I don't know if you're aware of it, uh, called AWAKE. So I hear quite a bit about domestic violence. Generally, domestic violence does not begin with physical violence. It, it's more psychological control stalking behavior, um, threatening behavior, uh, controlling behavior, and that it, it uh, escalates to uh, other kinds of behavior. So it begins with psychological abuse and control and escalates often to physical abuse or the threat of violence. Uh, and it can be the threat of violence within the home, a threat of violence regarding uh, one's um, family members. So. If a woman is feeling that she is being um, controlled or stalked, um, cell phones, uh, people uh, with uh, sometimes have to be called in every hour or so. Someone's calling in to check on where you are, beepers. Instead of it's sort of a safety measure, it can be a stalking measure. It's sort of a reframe of that. Uh, the other thing of um, the criticism and attacking the self-esteem of a woman so that um, she feels like she is worthless. Someone who continues to do that, that's a form of psychological assault to one's um, ego and well-being. So that's how it often starts. And that's how it, you probably recall from your days in uh, high school science about the frog when the, when the water is really um, cool and then gradually they warm it up until after a while the frog dies in the water. Well, that's in many ways what happens to women in domestic violence, that it starts off and by the time they're aware that they really are endangered, uh, it's really escalated to a very, very dangerous point. So that's domestic violence. And it was very important that it be included in the book. Domestic violence is also included in the chapter that deals with terrorism because domestic violence is a form of terrorism. I have a lot of women in my family. Uh, I wondered if the cost of mental health care is a substantial fraction of our enormous medical health care overall, and if it is, is it being spent uh, or apportioned appropriately? For example, it occurs to me that faith based I mean, you brought up religion, and that's the first thing that occurred to me. Do people who have uh, regular religious uh, meetings uh, or support n have fewer mental health problems, and if they do, then maybe faith-based services would be very effective in that case. And also, is financial stability or security an important factor? Do people who are financially insecure have more mental health care costs, in which case it might be more effective to deal with the financial security instead of the, letting it turn into a mental health care problem. And also, well, I have a list of things. Here also, in other words, prevention versus letting it become a case of treatment, as you would do with an ordinary illness. Uh, okay. Well, you did ask several questions, so that was a rich um, series of questions. Let me begin by saying the Complete Guide to Mental Health for Women has a preventive component to it because it is really advocating for health. And the prevention is that if you can anticipate, for example, uh, some of the sequelae that uh, occur following a divorce or separation, then you're more prepared to deal with it. Or what happens in terms of loss, or what happens in terms of when you um, have a family, when you adopt, all those topics are there, uh, that can possibly turn into points of stress but if you are able to anticipate, then you are better able to have strategies for managing it. So I'll begin by saying that, that th this book has a preventive quality to it in terms of 
if you know, you're better prepared to deal with it. This, one of the other questions you asked is about money. People, and there's a chapter in the book dealing with poverty. And part of uh, what happens about poverty is that you are under a great deal of stress. And stress can be very difficult for people to manage. And then the resources that you have access to when you're poor are less than the resources of people who are of means. It is very stressful. And it's not just the stress of just not having the general thing of not having money. It means you often are living in environments that are not safe. I mean, there's a, you don't have access to public transportation. It is not just not having money. If you deconstruct what it means to not have money, it means are you then having to choose between heat and food? That's what it means. And those, those are the real life things about it. Are you working two or three jobs as opposed to one job? That's stressful. Do you not have child care? Are you leaving children alone? That's stressful. Uh, are children unsupervised? All of that leads to stress. Are you, as some poor women do, taking care of everyone but themselves so that when they become ill, they are very seriously ill because they've allowed, uh, because of their concern for people around uh, in their lives, that they're, be, that they're very seriously ill when they do, in fact, check in with their physician. So, Money is very important in terms of access to resources and quality of life. If you have a quality of life, it is some protection from some illnesses. Now, uh, I think you asked some other questions. I wasn't taking notes. I didn't have uh, here. You want to something about the the total health budget and the percentage of it that goes toward mental health okay. care. In fact, it, it occurs to me to to uh, maybe clarify that question. Uh, one of my favorite comparisons is Germany, where there is no poverty. In other words, they have a health system which provide, or a social system that provides benefits for absolutely every citizen that, that brings them up to the, at least the lower middle class level. Do you have any sense, or if you don't, should you, of whether the German health care costs or the, the incidence of health care requirements in Germany are less? Because that would give an indication of whether uh, financial security has any influence on uh, the need for, on, you know, the incidence of uh, mental health care. Okay, let me, let me answer that question differently. And I will answer it in terms of, in this country often, there is a cap in terms of how much money can be expended for mental health services. By this, by by in insurance one, companies. For and, one individual? Yes. Okay. There's often a cap. But there's generally not a cap in terms of physical illness. Do you see the difference between the two? And the other thing is um, so that I don't, I would say that mental health services aren't comparable to physical health services in this country. The other thing is that often physical health illnesses, physical illnesses are related sometimes to mental health issues. So that means, for example, we now have a science that ties in physical health with mental health. If you have good mental health, that is a good protection from becoming physically ill. So you, even if you come from a family, for example, where there's a history of people being diabetic and um, having a certain lifestyle and have stress and they end up being diabetic or having high blood pressure, if people's mental health is such that it guards against that, even though they are predisposed by genetic makeup and heredity to have it, there is a less probability they'll have it if they are mentally well. That makes a world of difference. So, so I will not speak about Germany. What I can say is that investing in the mental health of people in this country could and will probably have an impact on physical health issues. So that's, that's in this country. And because of the lack of parity, it's called the word is parity, there's a lack of parity between physical illness and mental illness in terms of access to services. You asked another question regarding faith, and I want to address that issue. Um, the, the studies indicate that um, it's not true of everybody, but that um, for let's look at adolescents and the research looking at adolescents, and then I'll talk about adults. 
But adolescents who, in addition to other things, I mean, faith is not alone, but lots of other factors, a nurturing family, um, doing well in school and all that. But if there is this um, belief in uh, another being and a, having a, a goal in life and a function in life and feeling of value, that that contributes to their well-being. How about they have simply belonging to a church, even if you don't necessarily believe, just well, the community? Well, um, I, I think it does contribute, but we need um, studies of religion participation has been confusing because there's been confusion regarding spirituality and religiosity and, and psychology in my profession is a science and I think we're working on under, better understanding what happens there in terms of replication, not just saying go to church and it happens because children can go to church and people can go to church. But what happens, and again, someone asked a question about older individuals, the connections that could occur because churches often are places where people connect to other people. And, and if, in fact, you go to church or you're not connected, it doesn't serve that purpose for you. But if you go to institutions and you make connections and people care about you, then it can influence the quality of life that you lead. I, human beings are not necessarily meant to be isolated, alone kinds of people. So what happens if you belong to a community is that when you're ill or something occurs, you have a number of people who come and support you through that so that you don't necessarily um, become ill um, and are stressed out by that reality. So I hope that I've sort of addressed some of the issues that you've addressed. Yes, but I just wondered what, whether it wouldn't be cost effective to put some money into this kind of a, a, a religion, not pr promoting religion, but uh, instead of spending money on treatment of metal, health problems, put, it, put some money into congregations which are going to then create that climate which avoids the cost. It, it seems to me that somebody should be able to figure out whether that's cost effective or not, well, well, if, if it's constitutional. Well, let me just say that um, there are individuals with serious psychiatric problems that will, that will, will not be treated by virtue of their being in a church. Um, schizophrenia would be one serious bipolar illnesses. There are very serious psychiatric difficulties that, that um, need professional uh, help. But what can happen to the families of the people who have schizophrenia is that communities can offer support to them so they're not isolated. There is stigma still in this country related to having a mental illness, and we need to own that. I have a couple of topics that I wonder if, it, if it's included in your book. One is substance abuse and alcoholism. I, I'm a social worker and a psychotherapist, and I'm stunned at the increasing number of women with very, very serious drug and alcohol problems. You know, I've been working this kind of job for 15 years, and mm -hmm. the incidence, I would say, is 100% increased. So that's one topic I wonder if you're addressing and mm -hmm. the change in women's um, problems with it. And the other is, another problem that I see a lot is grandparents raising a second generation of mm -hmm. kids and the stress that that puts on them and they never get their turn. <laughs> um, so, Okay, two questions and there is a chapter on women and addictions uh, in the book that addresses that. And you're right that many women are struggling with addictions. Some of the addictions are an attempt to self-medicate. Um, the other is sometimes people are come from families where that is a part of the family culture of, of alcoholism. It's, it's sort of what they know. Uh, and it is very problematic in terms of their um, development and, and also their capacity to uh, establish and maintain relationships and terms of child rearing. So women and addictions is really very, very um, big. And there are programs where people are trying to figure out strategies for better dealing with addictions. It's a complicated illness, mental illness that people have. The second question you asked about is grandparenting. And often the grandparents who raise children are in fact mother, grandmothers, they're not grandfathers. And uh, initially, this was seen as one mainly of poor people, but it's been now a range of individuals uh, and classes where people are doing the grandparenting. And that's um, because of sometimes the substance abuse 
and, and people aren't, uh, don't want their children to be raised by strangers, so they end up taking them in. Um, and mental illness, other mental illness, um, that they end up raising their children, and it is really a challenge and can be very stressful for them. And in some communities, grandparents get together and support each other through the process. But a very good point to be raised. Yes, thank you. Hello. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Um, last fall, I, I was trying to find myself a therapist and trying to wade through the whole system and figure out what was going on. And it's very difficult and, and discouraging. And I'd like to share a few things and ask you to comment on them. Um, number one, um, many therapists never returned my phone call. Number two, I got one to admit to me that she didn't take my health insurance because it only paid her like $50 a session. Um, and I was trying to get a sense of, well, why couldn't I find the best kind of people I wanted and buy that with my insurance because I can't afford to pay myself. Uh, there are many people like me out there. Um, in, in, the, in the whole profession, say in the metropolitan Boston area, what is like the median rate for therapy, whether it's social worker or psychologist, psychiatrist, get, give a sense of the economics of it and how much is really being supported by by insurance and what are the pressures from insurance on therapists meaning what I can actually end up with as a prospective um, client um, what I have as re real resources for myself and not ones that are just written on paper by the insurance I'm paying into they say I can have this this and this and the other thing I experienced was um, it seems the pressure is give me a drug and send me away, and I'll be okay. It's like the first, the first suggestion I ever get is, well, are you on medication? Well, why don't you go on? And maybe I don't want to choose that route, but I don't see that there's a real viable alternative out there. Uh, if you could comment on the whole political economic picture of this thing, I'd be most appreciative. Um, let me just say that uh, she's raising a very important question in terms of individuals seeking care. Currently, uh, the insurance companies have a great deal of power with regard to reimbursement. And so many people discover when they seek mental health services that first they, um, the insurance company determines which hospital they can go to where they can receive outpatient care. They determine the rate of it, uh, that they can receive when they go to see a private practitioner. And um, so it's, it's very limiting, and I think that's a surprise to people that it's very tough to find someone. I really am sorry that you call people and they did not return your call. That is not good practice. Um, and people do uh, need to make a living, and um, being paid $50 an hour uh, at this point in terms of people's career, it feels like it's less than adequate. I don't want to comment on what would be a standard fee, but to say that fee would be low in some circles among some people. There are a range of people who can offer mental health services, including licensed independent social workers. Uh, there, uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, there are licensed psychologists and psychiatrists, and, and there are also licensed uh, mental uh, health providers too. They're all licensed uh, by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and, and they um, charge different amounts of money. The, the complication is that if you don't want psychopharmacology, then you need to be clear about that and seek someone who uh, is open to uh, providing other services to you. And after they gotten to know you, rather than to talk to you for a few minutes and write you a script, that that is somewhat problematic um, because it may not be quite what you need. So it does require a certain amount of assertiveness on the part of people seeking services to figure out where they can go, what are the options, um, talking, um, calling the, for example, the professional organizations there to ask them for recommendations. In the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, 
There is the Massachusetts Psychological Association. There is the social workers have their association here. And those are wonderful resources for trying to find therapists to provide you with services. But I would agree that it is very frustrating to find out, and it's really a surprise to know that uh, your that maybe your benefits that you think that you have are not quite adequate, and therefore you're not you don't have the freedom to choose whatever you want to in terms of services. So that is a frustration. Other questions or comments? I was just curious if you had any. I, I didn't get to look at all of the book yet. If I just wanted to put a plug in for nurses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I wondered if you had any nurses helping you and also wanted to comment that there are nurses who are therapists also. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that addition. I appreciate that. I don't recall that nurses wrote. The people who edited the book were two psychologists and one psychiatrist. And um, we ended up primarily um, including people from our particular fields. We also had LICSWs who were in, involved in, in terms of the writing. <laughs> but I stand corrected and I certainly add nurses to the clinicians who can offer services. Jessica, I'd like to ask you, what, what do you see for the future for women's mental health treatment and research? What kinds of things need to happen to adjust the current system to make it serve women better? Well, I'll, I'll put on my academic hat and answer that. One of the things I think is very important to have more women conducting research. I think when women conduct research on women, they will ask questions that are important to women. Uh, I think that's a, an important beginning to, and they will come in with women's perspectives because women's lives really differ a lot and uh, I think that's really very important. So part of it is to have many more women researchers involved. The, the second is that it's going to be very important to look at the cross-section of women who currently live in the United States. So we have women who are immigrants and how they address and deal with mental health issues is very important. They are here to stay. These are not temporary people. Uh, and so we need to be able to look at them and to uh, provide services that are appropriate for them. We also, in terms of additional issues, um, we need to be, I think, um, more aware of the impact of images on women and their self-esteem and on the generation of eating disorders. It's a very important area. Eating disorders are, um, can, can, in fact, at times be tragic. That is, people actually die from it. So in, in this society, we need to be aware of, uh, of having more information about this, maybe having more protections for particularly our young women who are consumed by imagery and try to be something that they really can't be. Even though you tell them that it's airbrushed and that's not real and most people can never look like that, they still strive for those images much to their detriment at times and they feel less inadequate when they're not able to look like the models that they see in the various magazines. I think also that um, we need to think about women who are striving to move up the corporate ladder. Uh, the particular stresses of women in high-powered positions and their mental health and how they balance home and, and uh, work. And we're seeing in the newspaper, at least that's a report, that some women are walking away from those situations and we need to create environments where women can be in major decision-making positions that um, they're not placed in, in a position where they have to choose between having a family and having a job. And I think that we need to um, do research where they can uh, have good mental health and have positions in terms of making decisions that impact all of us. I think it's very important in a country where about 50% of the people are women that 50% of the people make major decisions in this country should be women. And the way it's so structured is that women can't do that and have families often. So we need to figure out how to make it more friendly to them so their mental health is not compromised and not stretched to the max. I think that's, those are some of the things I think we need to think about in terms of, um, of research. We need to, to look at women's, women's lives. And, and we also need, I think, to look at, at um, ways in which women relieve stress. 
We know some of the current research is that women's relationships are very important. We need to look more carefully about what is in the relationship that makes it so healthy for women to have women as friends. I think that's important. And I guess the final thing, I'm sort of thinking as I'm standing here, the whole notion of what keeps women from connecting to women. Um, there's um, now a, people looking at uh, women in terms of indirect assaults that women engage in with other women that keep them very separate from each other. Um, and so we need to figure out how to um, study this and how we can um, really create lifestyles and ways of looking at other women that really support women in general. So those are some ideas that I have about our future and what, what's needed for women's mental health across the board. Thank you, Jessica Henderson Daniel.